Good morning. Good morning. You're invited to come into the sanctuary and prepare to worship together as the family of God. Meanwhile, let's all rise and join in the call to worship as we're able. It'll be up on the screen. Sing songs of loudest praise. Hosanna. Hosanna. Sing songs that are unashamed. Hosanna. Hosanna. Sing songs without being afraid. Hosanna. Hosanna. Sing for the God of tomorrow and today. Hosanna. Hosanna. Let's, Let's worship, worship and, and remember, remember the, the one worthy, worthy to, to be praised. praised. We'll be uh, singing a song, and you can wave your branches, but or go get one. The processional will be coming a little later. Not quite yet. And feel free to, uh, during this song, to come up and you can dip your hand in the baptism water bowl and uh, make a sign of the cross on your wrist or forehead. You can do that during this song anytime. You're welcome. Let all things now living a song of thanksgiving. God the Creator triumphantly raised, who fashioned and made us, protected and stayed us. seated.
Um, so when I was thinking about how I remembered Holy Week, um, oh, I'm Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. This is Benji. Hi, I'm Benji. All right, so when I remembered Holy Week, I couldn't remember doing things actually as an adult a lot, to be honest with you. So I remember um, we had um, sunrise services as a youth group in New Jersey. So it was actually sort of getting to be sunny um, earlier. Um, and I've done some things. I, we attended Easter um, plays at Blythefield. But my observation of Holy Week as an adult, um, especially over the past 10 years or so, um, has been not really intentional. So I was thinking about it, how do I remember Christ's resurrection and um, death? And these are two things that I thought of as signs and symbols for me. So the first one, what's in your hand, has been on my computer screen, my lock screen, for about five to 10 years, I don't know how long. And it it's reminds me of when Moses was arguing with God, I can't do this, how am I gonna do this, leading the people out of Israel? And he says, what's in your hand? You have my staff, you have my power, you have my ability to make things happen. Um, and then the second one is my tattoo on my arm because I needed to remember God's grace for myself and it's stamped on my arm and I struggle sometimes to have it in my heart for myself and for other people. So those are two signs and symbols. I think they're actually symbols. I think what's in your hand is more of a symbol than the tattoo right now for me because I've seen over and over and over again how God has taken care of things that I thought he wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to and he wouldn't be able to in my job, in my marriage and with our children and just in life. So I'm hoping that the grace piece, even as I'm older, um, it will become a symbol as well, continue to become a symbol. So that's how I remember God's resurrection and his um, sanctification throughout all of our lives. Those are two things for me. Are you ready? Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. People rolled out the red carpet in cloaks for Jesus. They hailed Jesus as king. If we keep quiet, even the stones would cry out. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Thank you, Sarah and Benji, for helping us remember and um, for Dana for getting that uh, video from Andrew Harmon, who was a member, is still a member, here at Creston, so and many of you uh, may have met, maybe newer folks have met Andrew because he continues to come and visit when he's in town. So what a gift to be able to hear his voice and how he remembers Holy Week. We are on a journey of remembering. We've been remembering all Lent, all different ways we remember our shared faith together and even Andrew mentioned how he remembers and Sarah mentions how she remembers and we gather each week to remember, remember who we are, remember whose we are, remember that we are in this journey of faith together as a community to remember God and as a community here at Creston Church, we would like you to remember that whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, you are welcome here. And this is God's house. And we want you to remember that God is a hospitable God. And God greets you. So as you are able... I invite you to stand for a greeting from our God of grace. Receive God's greeting. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God, the love of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
you may notice that there are palm branches among us in our midst here. Um, we owe, and Cider's got a cache of them right here. Uh, there's a, a, a tent of palm branches. And I hear that Avon is going to be leading a palm branch processional. So I, during, um, we're about to greet each other. During that greeting time, I invite all the kiddos and anybody who wants to, to head to the back and meet Avon at the back of the, of the sanctuary. And they're gonna, we're gonna walk around the church singing, well, singing, dancing, waving, celebrating Christ the King. And <laughs> cider too. All right. So as we, um, as we spend some time rejoicing, and uh, I invite you to also greet those with whom you are worshiping, including friends of Sheila, who are here to hear the word proclaimed from their friend today. Uh, greet those with whom you are worshiping. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children say, through pilgrim court and temple, the lovely anthem rang, to Jesus who had blessed them, was folded to his breast, the children sang them. The simplest and the best From all in that they followed Mid an exultant crowd The victory palm branch waving And chanting clear and loud The Lord of earth and heaven Rode on Scorn that little children should on his bidding wait. Hosanna in the highest, that ancient song we sing. For Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven, our King. Oh, may we ever praise him with heart and light and voice, and in his blissful presence. 
for our prayer of confession. Holy God, today we hail Christ as King and Lord of our lives. We long to be bold and brave, to proclaim the gospel good news of Jesus in word and deed. However, we practice, in practice, often we stand against the wall, silent and safe. We remain quiet and let others carry the song. We watch our siblings pursue justice and practice mercy. We observe while someone else advocates for the gospel goodness for all people. God, God have, have mercy. mercy. Show us which are our songs to sing. Show us which are our parades to lead. Give us the courage and conviction to do both. With, With honesty, honesty and, and hope, we pray. We pray. Amen. Amen. Hear this assurance of pardon. Friends, no matter where you are on the parade route, whether you are pal waving palm branches through the streets or standing against the wall, quiet and cautious, Jesus marched for you. Jesus' love and pursuit of justice and mercy was for you. You are included in this story. Nothing can ever change that. So hear these words and trust them deep in your bones. We have reason to sing. Jesus Christ loved you yesterday. Jesus Christ loves you today, and Jesus Christ will love you tomorrow. You are forgiven, claimed, and sent out to serve. Go out singing and trusting these words. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit for the affirmation of faith. 
We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who rode, rode through, through the streets, streets of, of Jerusalem, Jerusalem on, on a donkey. donkey. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who, who challenged Rome's, Rome's oppressive, oppressive power with, with peaceful, peaceful protest. protest. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who, who was, was surrounded, surrounded by, by crowds of, of dreamers and, and believers. believers. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, so, so even today, today we, we will sing songs of loudest, loudest praise. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed, blessed is the, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. seated. We now have an opportunity to identify and share with one another moments in our lives where we have experienced God's goodness or the Spirit's presence. And we do this to uh, encourage one another and to um, honor the Spirit's presence in our lives. So if you have a God story, raise your hand, and I'll bring you this mic, and then we'll have some words on the screen to give God glory. Who has a God story to share today? And please say your name. My name is Avon, and I sold enough pies to be in the top five, to be one of the top five sellers. And I get the pie teacher in the face. <laughs> so, and I'll just add to that. He, he so Avon was selling pies for a fundraiser at his school, and he sold twenty-two pies and. Almost all of them were from people at Creston Church. <laughs> and um, two things I think is a God story. Um, one, uh, Avon is probably our shyest child, so I just think it's a grace that he felt um, comfortable enough to go up to almost everybody <laughs> in the church um, and ask on his own to <clears throat> if they wanted a pie. And also, um, just thinking about, like, our church is so small, and we are behind on our own budget, <laughs> and yet, like, um, in this tiny, small church, um, Avon was, like, able to raise enough money to be in the top five in his school. I just think that's a, a beautiful testament of the abundance, uh, God's abundance. Thank you to both you, to Dana and Evan for 
And I forgot, if you, your pie is in the fridge downstairs, so you can get it after the service, and your name's on it. For this grace, God, we give you praise. So my name is Sarah. When I'm up front, actually, when I'm even holding this mic, I get exceedingly nervous. I forgot to read the, along with that staff. This is my one of my... Um, life verses psalm ninety seventeen. may the favor of the lord our god rest on us establish the work of our hands for us yes establish the work of our hands so this verse goes along with that picture for my symbol of god's covenant and establishment of us and so my god's story is oh i think i might cry i thought i was going to be able to do this so my lost pearl girl, I feel like we lost because we moved her to God freely, which I know is sort of hopefully in God's plan and God knows exactly where she and her brother are, no matter where they live or what school, they're on the roster of what school, whether they're in school is another story. Um, so I have to believe in this verse um, because, you know, you're strong, and I didn't realize how much grief. I have to be strong as a social worker for students, teachers, and staff, and parents. So um, I guess I can be vulnerable. <laughs> so anyway, I, I know he has to establish. I went to her home. It was one of the, I've seen a lot of homes in Grand Rapids and all over the world, all over the country. And it was one of the worst homes I've ever seen. And I've been around a long time in social work for 40 years. And um, so I know that um, that's what, I guess, God is stretching my faith. Um, she has to walk to school. I got her another backpack because it broke. Got her an alarm to get her up. Like, she won't get an Uber ride or... Um, transportation, she has to walk to school and get herself up and her brother up. But um, anyway, a lot of things went really, really well Thursday. I mean, it went very, very well. So um, two principals and me were there. Um, the Godfrey Lee people were really cool. Um, they came out of the house. We waited for about 15 minutes, and I prayed the whole time. The kids came out of the house, and one of the gentlemen that, or is their caregiver, came with us to the schools. The, they don't have a guardian. The school is their guardian, because um, no adults are their guardians. No one will step up and claim them as a, as theirs yet. So um, anyway, so I believe that God does establish the work of my hands, and I believe in Romans eight twenty eight, and I really believe in twenty nine. <laughs> which means I think a lot of people forget that part. It's like he conforms us to his image of his son. And this is, I think, just another opportunity for me to be conformed and God working in me as I know that I have to believe that he'll establish the work of our hands and he has that staff. Um, so anyway, and then just as an aside, I hope it's a really cool thing. I was hoping C Kristen would be here. Kristen Bile is her next social Bilesma is her next social worker. So hopefully the kid will go to school and hopefully God freely will pursue them along with God. Thank you for your um, your your grace in her life Sarah and God's grace in her we see God's grace in her life through you, through Kristen, through that whole arrangement. And we, um, yeah, we, we see just the heaviness and the beauty as well. So thank you for sharing that. For this grace, God, we give you praise. Um. My name is Monica, and I made this bracelet for Ada, but she wasn't here.
for the grace of friendship and generosity. We give you praise. Anybody else? This is Greg, um, and in light of the boil water advisory list last week, I know uh, a lot of us were affected here in the Creston neighborhood. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to pick up cases of water from the, the city's pickup point, um, and when I got home from doing that, I found another case of water on my porch. Um, no, no, just someone had graciously left water on a bunch of uh, porches up and down Buffalo. Um, and I know the Neighborhood Association was also delivering water to those that could, did not have transportation to, uh, to reach those pickup points. And so I'm really glad for the generosity of our neighbors. Thank you, Greg, for that grace, God. We give you praise. Someone else. I had my two sisters visiting last week, which was a lot of fun. <clears throat> but I just wanted to share that they both appreciated our service, which was kind of remarkable to me because we all are kind of disagree on different theological <laughs> issues. So um, I think that felt like kind of a sign that God is present here and leading us here. Thank you, Lisa. They were lovely and encouraging and just wonderful people. And I, I appreciated all of the camaraderie among you. So for these wonderful graces, God, we give you praise. This can. You probably know it's the middle of tax season. And uh, Sharon and I have been volunteering again at the local VITA site, Volunteer Tax Assistance. It's a site that probably began with Sharon and I working here at Creston Church 45 years ago. It's now located at St. Alphonsus in the abandoned parish ministry. It used to be the school. Now it's uh, various ministries of St. Al's. What struck me over the course of this tax season, there are many, many people who volunteer. You can do anything from greeting to checking in, to doing the tax data entry, to checking it. But in all of those people, they're not accountants. They're not tax people. They're just ordinary folks from different places, from different churches, with the willingness, the um, eagerness to serve. The people we serve, most of the time, uh, reflect that. They know it. They appreciate it. They are grateful to God because we are willing to help. I see a picture of Christian life for us. We don't have to do fancy things. We need those fancy things done, but we don't have to all do them. What we do need is each other. And as we work together, we serve the community that's here in this building, that surrounds this building, that goes as far as we can imagine. And God is there with us through the whole thing. Thank you, Ken. A neighbor this week 
talk to me about you. You did her taxes, and she asked me about this church because she knew that bald guy who did her taxes goes to this church. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she was so grateful. Thank you for the big picture. I, I really appreciate how you captured that. For this grace, God, we give you praise. Someone else? My granddaughter, Mahina, attends uh, the Roots group. Oh, my name is Betty. And uh, last week, Sunday night, I picked her up to bring her home. And she jumped in the car and she said, every time I go to this meeting, I just feel so loved. I'm like, wow. I said, really? And she goes, Beppa, you are so lucky to be a part of this church. Do you know how much Christian, how Christian people at Creston love everybody? So thank you to the Roots Group leaders, the Roots Group kids. And uh, yeah, God is moving even among young people who don't belong to this church. So thank you for that testimony. For this grace, God. We give you praise. Let's pray. God, we have heard the generous testimonies here today of how you are moving in this church and through people in this church. And we are grateful to be part of that story we ask that you show us how to lean in to that kind of love and grace and goodness that you author. And we ask that you show us how you are moving in our lives, in the lives of this church, in the life of this church, in the life of this community, we don't want to miss a thing. Would you increase our awareness so we can fully grasp how wide and long and high and deep is your love in this world through Christ? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's time for the kids to come on forward, ages three through fifth grade. You can line up across the front. Waiting for a few more. And we are going to do our um, blessing. The adults are going to start. And then we'll do our blessing back. And then God will bless us and stay right here with us. So adults, if you want to start. My name is Al, and uh, 
Please join me now in the prayers of the people. Lord Jesus, we praise you on this day when we remember your triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Based on verses from Psalm 118, Hosanna, O Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is our God, and he has made his light shine upon us. We give thanks to you, Lord, for you are good, and your love endures forever. Jesus, as this day also marks the first day of Passion Week, during which we remember your intense suffering and death on the cross, may we see and know your humility, your submission, in obedience to your Father, and your love demonstrated for us. Today we pray for your mercy to those in special need of your care, your nearness, your restoration in their lives. We pray for people in this church family, including Twyla, Don and Beverly, Esther, Elaine, Martha, all quite restricted to their homes or living facilities. Please provide for each according to their needs. For Jan in her journey with ataxia disease, we pray for your strength and provision in her life. We pray for recoveries from surgeries illnesses and accidents for several among us. We pray especially for Benita, a neighbor who in, had a serious surgery recently, and uh, we pray for her family. We pray for your comfort and abiding care for those who grieve the loss of loved one. We pray for peace in our world, for your restraint of evil and violence. We pray for your kingdom to come, that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray now for Sheila as she get, leads us in the message that she has prepared from your word. May your spirit guide both speaker and each listener. Amen. Our scripture, <laughs> sorry, <Jan. laughs> our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter eleven, beginning at verse one. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them. Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. The disciples went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there, asked, What are you doing untying that colt? The disciples answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When the disciples brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. The story of the triumphal entry is fairly well-known and well-loved in the church. Uh, Many of us are accustomed to the waving of palm branches on Palm Sunday each year, but I wonder if the meaning of this story gets lost on us over time. I would like to begin today by orienting ourselves in the book of Mark. Mark is one of the earliest accounts of the life of Jesus. It was the first gospel that was written. And the first half of the book is filled with stories of Jesus' authority, stories of healing, of teaching, and of miracles. It all illustrates the divine power that backed his ministry. And yet all along, after each one of these events, Jesus tells those who experience his healing power not to tell anyone who he is. About halfway through Mark in chapter 8, Jesus asks his disciples, his closest friends, who do you say that I am? And I want to hear from you, congregation, who do you say Jesus is? So you can call out names for Jesus. Who do you think of? Uh, Who do you think Jesus is? Lord, Prince of Peace. Others. Messiah. Son of Mary. Son of God. So to this question, Peter is the first to answer, per usual, and says, you are the Messiah. And yet, even though this was the right answer, Jesus still tells him not to tell anyone. So up to this point, he has not confirmed to anyone who he is. In verse 1 of our passage, Jesus and his disciples are approaching Jerusalem from Jericho for the festival of Passover. Passover is an annual celebration of when God liberated the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. This celebration was a time of great joy, and it was no small gathering either. This was a grand-scale celebration. At this time, Jerusalem had a population of roughly 30 to 80,000 people, but during Passover, there were between 100,000 and 300,000 people who would travel to Jerusalem on pilgrimage to remember the Passover. So I think a visualization of this number is helpful to get a sense of the immensity of this celebration. Uh, To me, any number of people above 1,000 is a lot, so (laughs) I think I would benefit from just seeing an illustration. So has anyone here ever been to the big house for a football game? You can raise your hand if you have. All right, so for those of us who haven't, here's a picture of the big house. Does anyone have any guesses on how many people the big house can seat? Three hundred nine thousand. All right, Chris, that's (laughs) quite a big stadium. Anyone else? One hundred nine. All right, Dave is really close. So the capacity of the big house is. 107,601 people. So as we think about the Passover, there is between one big house to three big houses of people who are all going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate. This, This event was not happening in a quiet, subtle situation. There was a lot of banter, a lot of joy, a lot of celebration as people gathered together. And people would go to Jerusalem days early to get a place to stay. Because as you can imagine, a city 
with a population of at most 80,000 people would have a hard time accommodating this many guests. So in the midst of this context, this is where we find Jesus and his disciples traveling to Jerusalem. He's one of hundreds of thousands in the crowds, and up until this point, he has told no one who he is. To help further visualize what the triumphal entry looked like, um, I put together this map of the journey that verse 1 illustrates. So Jesus and the disciples had been in Jericho, which is not on this map. Um, And they then traveled 15 miles over uh, treacherous terrain in order to arrive at Bethany, which is in the bottom right corner. They stayed with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha there. And... It is on, located on the side of the Mount of Olives. So this whole area is the Mount of Olives. It's about two miles from Jerusalem where the temple is. So it is thought that when Jesus told the disciples to go up ahead and secure him a colt, they probably went to Bethphage and then returned to bring the colt to Jesus. And that triumphal entry from Bethany to the temple is roughly two miles. So it could be anywhere from less than that to up to two miles long. (laughs) Let's return to our text. Verses 7 to 10 are all Mark gives us to describe the significance of this moment, the triumphal entry. As we heard earlier, Mark writes, When the disciples brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Remember this question we considered earlier? Who do we say Jesus is? Well, this moment, this triumphal entry, is the moment where Jesus makes an announcement to all people about who he is. And his announcement is this. I am the Messiah. I am the king you have been waiting for. Did you see that in the text? If not, I did not catch it the first time I read it either. So how does he announce this? He announces it through the fulfillment of a prophecy, through riding on a previously unridden colt, and through reminiscent imagery of previous kingly entries. Let's turn to Zechariah 9, which prophesies the coming of Zion's king. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Many of the people traveling to Jerusalem would have been familiar with this text, and all of them would have been waiting and hoping for and anticipating the coming of a kingdom that God had promised to their father David. The unwritten col- unwritten cult is also a crucial element of Jesus' announcement. Half of the verses in our text are all about acquiring this cult. <laughs> it was key that Jesus ride on an unwritten cult because in the Old Testament, This is what kings were commanded to ride on. They were not riding on war horses that were used also for common use. That colt was assigned essentially from birth to that king for royal purposes. In the book of Samuel, we also have record of the Ark of the Covenant, which was God's presence among the people, carried on a cart that was pulled by unridden colts. The presence of God led by this consecrated, uh, consecrated cult 
for royal purposes. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing. So if the sight of Jesus riding on a young donkey into Jerusalem among thousands of people didn't awaken some pilgrims to what was going on here, there was one more element of this whole scene that might have triggered some memories. This wasn't the first time that cloaks filled the path and leafy branches were waved in the air as a king processed among people. For those well-versed in the Hebrew Bible, Jesus' triumphal entry would have reminded them of when Solomon entered the city on David's mule, or when Jehu was anointed king. In the triumphal entry, Jesus checked many boxes to signal that he indeed was the Messiah they were waiting for. He rode into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of a donkey, an unridden donkey at that, and cloaks and leafy branches, reminiscent of King Solomon and King Jehu's coronations, were present. There were many people in Israel, both before and after Jesus' coming, who claimed to be the Messiah. So Jesus was not the first, and he was certainly not the last. There were even some like Bar Kokhba in 132 AD, who, read, who led a revolt of the Jewish people against the Roman Empire. There was this expectation of what a Messiah would look like, and Bar Kokhba fit that image. The righteous and victorious nature of the king that we read about in Zechariah 9 was appealing to the people waiting for a Messiah. And so far, Jesus has checked all of these same boxes. So what does it mean for us that Jesus is king? Since we aren't ruled by a king in this country, I wonder if this, the importance of this is lost on us. And yet, we think about, advocate for, complain about, and protest people in power of other forms all the time. Whether that be national leaders, presidents, vice presidents, Supreme Court justices, managers, supervisors, executives, principals, bosses, or boards of all kinds, we all have opinions about leadership and power. Who's the right person for the job? Are they exercising their leadership properly? We all know from different experiences that anyone with power sets the tone or establishes a culture for that group. Sometimes this is really positive and other times it's detrimental. I think we can all agree that the state of political leadership in the United States and in the globe is far from ideal. Those in political power and those seeking political power are often sly, power hungry, immature, and arrogant. They seek power not to serve, but to be served. We the people must sift through news reports critically in order to discern what is true. Just this past week, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu claimed, we have to finish the job. We need total victory. There is no substitute for total victory. Last month, the death toll in Gaza surpassed 30,000 at his bidding. And still he claimed, we can't compromise with total victory because I'll tell you, we can't win the peace if we don't win the war. And we will win this war. The most important thing to him is winning. It's power. And he's certainly not the only one. We find this power-hungry pride all over our news feeds, as we prepare for elections here at home. And dare I say, there are slim pickings if you're hoping to elect a wise, courageous, just, caring, and humble national leader. Let's return to our text. This last verse really intrigues me. It says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The notes in my Bible read, are you serious? There was a whole two-mile-long parade into the city, and at the end of it, Jesus just looks around, decides it's late, and goes home. That's it. What kind of conclusion is that? 
Mark makes no mention of a welcome committee or any acknowledgement whatsoever for the long, that the long-awaited Messiah has arrived. But perhaps this is the conclusion we need. In lectionary Bible study this week, Danley mentioned, perhaps this is the most fitting conclusion to the triumphal entry we could have. Jesus wasn't meant with pomp and circumstance. All he does when he arrives is look around. Now, the Greek word for this looking around action is periblep, sorry, peri, <laughs> periblepsomenos, a word only mentioned in the New Testament five times. It translate, translates to something greater than just looked around. There's a tone of concern and attentiveness. Jesus wasn't wowed by the grandeur of the temple architecture. He instead was intensely noticing, with concern, the ways that people had twisted, misused, and corrupted the same space that they gathered in to worship, to make sacrifices to God, and to remember the faithfulness of God through generations. Jesus enters the temple to inspect it. And the following day, Jesus would provoke many by driving out the greed and pride which had cluttered his father's holy house. Remember the signs and symbols that Jesus showed in his announcement that he was the Messiah? Remember how the crowds rallied alongside him when Jesus announced that he was king? Their commitment did not last long. They didn't know that within one week, Jesus, King and Messiah, would suffer and die. Jesus no longer fit the image of that perfect Messiah, that all-powerful Savior and King they had imagined. He was just another fake, and they would reject him as such. Merely five days later, when Pilate offered to release the imprisoned Jesus back to the Jewish people, they rejected him and replaced their hosannas with the cry to crucify him. Jesus' title, King of the Jews, would even be used against him as ridicule. In the suffering leading up to his death, he would be mock-worshipped, robed in royal purple cloth, and crowned with a crown of thorns. Is this what Jesus' kingship looks like? One of my seminary professors this week said, Our understanding of salvation depends on a Savior who chose the weakness of suffering and persecution over pomp and circumstance. Jesus' task as king was far greater than leading a political revolt against the Roman Empire and other political entities as David had done. He came to conquer death itself. Suffering and sacrifice for us and for our all of creation defines Jesus' messianic reign. The good news we receive in this text is that the one who has true authority and power is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the embodiment of love and humility, righteousness and justice. And his rule turns our earthly norms for kingly reign on its head. Our savior of the world, who has more power than all leaders of this world combined, chose to give himself up for our sake. Though many leaders today seek power not to serve, but to be served, Jesus says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our king rides on a colt, not a war horse. Our king comes to bring peace, not war. And it's good news for us that he will remain king forever. He's not going up for re-election. When our relationships crumble, Jesus is king. When our labor becomes too much for us to do alone, Jesus is king. When addiction rears its ugly head, 
Jesus is king. When a loved one receives an unbearable diagnosis, Jesus is king. When we fall short of the demands of love, Jesus is king. When mental illness drags us down to the pits of despair, Jesus is king. When fill in the blank, Jesus is king. And as king, Jesus is establishing the restoration and renewal of all things. Jesus' triumphal entry announces his kingship. And then five days later, he showed us what his kingly reign looks like. The reign of Jesus Christ looks like the greatest act of sacrifice and love this world has ever seen. What wondrous love is this, O oh, people of God? Let's pray. King Jesus, we thank you for this reminder that in this world of many distractions, of many who are seeking power, of twisted and corrupted systems of struggle, that you are king above all. We ask that you would help us to remember this as we enter into Holy Week now. As we go with you to the Garden of Gethsemane and to Golgotha. As we remember your sacrifice and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, church. This is Melanie. I'm a deacon here at Creston. We are doing our offering this morning. The special offering is for uh, VIS, and the loose offering is for the general fund. Um, the general or the special offering, if you'd like to have your gift go toward them, there's the manila envelopes in the book racks in front of you. There are also cards you will find there where you can put a prayer request on one side and contact information on the other side if you would like us to reach out to you and you'd like to hear more about, oh, there we go, Pastor Heather has them. <laughs> If you would like us to reach out to you and get connected with this church, may God bless you as you give. Okay, announcements. It's Holy Week, including Monday, Thursday, and there are some prearranged dinners at homes coming up and available through a Google document and also in the back, I believe. She's with the kids. May I speak what Lisa was going to speak? <laughs> so Lisa is a host, and she was going to say she would warmly welcome, and Dave is a host. <laughs> he lives with Lisa. <laughs> and they would warmly welcome you into their homes. And she also said that she would also happily go to any of the other homes that are hosting. The last I checked, there were exactly five other human beings signed up for homes. It, it was Joshua, Chris and me, and Jake and Sheila. We are the only five people in five homes <laughs> signed up so far. So there's lots of room to go. I think there's like 55 slots or something. So if you would like to go to dinner and have a, a thoughtful evening planned, we'd love for you to sign up. Lisa's comment to me this morning was she's thinking of going to the neighbors and inviting um, just your neighbors to come in uh, and fill the slots. So just food for thought uh, to maybe to other hosts and to those of you who would like to participate in this intentionally planned Monday Thursday event. Okay, that's Thursday. Friday, Good Friday. Uh, there's a neighborhood service taking place at Second Congregational Church on Cheshire, Cheshire Street, just off Plainfield up by uh, toward Kingma. And that starts at 12 noon. Easter Sunday, there's a service here at 10. Prior to that, breakfast at 9. And please bring something next week that reminds you that Jesus lives. And also today and next week, we'll have prayer servants down front after the closing song, for which we are invited to rise in body or in spirit as you're able for the closing song.
Hello, there we go. As you enter Holy Week, uh, God blesses you on your way. God blesses you and keeps you. God's face shines on you, and God is gracious to you. God turns toward you, and God smiles on you. God gives you peace. Amen. Thank you. 